Good day and welcome to our College Sports Communicators live webinar. We're pleased to offer this session on working with baseball and softball statistics, stat rules, and producing accurate stats. Thanks for joining this important session as we discuss ways to assist CSC members in all areas of working with baseball and softball statistics and stats rules. Our presenters are leaders in college baseball and softball communications and statistics, and they are here to offer their thoughts and expertise and take your questions. It's always a learning situation with baseball and softball stats. And we welcome your questions at any time. Just place them in the Q&A function of this Zoom. You can use the chat function to comment, but please place all your questions in the Q&A channel. That'll make it easier. I am Robert McKinney, and I currently serve as the Assistant Athletics Director Communications at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. I'll serve as your moderator. I may step in from time to time with comments, but most of our presentation will be from the three panelists you see. We're recording this webinar and later on the CSC website and the YouTube page. You can watch it as an on-demand session. We will also will offer it on numerous podcast channels. Please invite fellow current CSC colleagues to listen and watch this too. We appreciate you joining us today and remember to ask your questions again in the Q&A area. We've got lots to cover, so let's get started. I was set up to be able to announce our panelists and then suddenly briefly lost them for a moment. Okay, our panelists are Ryan Gallant at Utah, University of Utah, where he is Associate Director, Athletic Communications. We have Frank Mercogliano from the University of New Mexico, where he is the Assistant Athletic Director for Communications and recently became a grandfather. Also, we have Bridget Robles at the University of Richmond, where she assists the Spiders as Assistant Director of Athletics, Public Relations. And we're really happy to have this panel of very experienced baseball and softball stats folks. And now let's get underway with the uh, part of our webinar, which is discussing those various factors. Um, first of all, I wanted to just kind of mention briefly that no one is sure exactly when Genius Software will be coming out for baseball softball. They had originally hoped to have a beta program this spring, but it looks like that's gonna be put off probably by a year or two, but hopefully that'll be a, a really good program for everyone once that happens. In the meantime, most people are either on Presto stats or still using Stat Crew. Um, we're not going to focus a lot on the individual programs, but more on what we do as stats in general and how the score plays. So we want to start out with what do you need for personnel to keep stats or in your press box on game day? And we're going to let that begin with Bridget, who can fill us in a little bit on what she does at Richmond. Yep, at Richmond, uh, we have a small press box, but we overlook the field, thankfully, so we're up high. Um, so I use, I have my binoculars, I have multiple pens and pencils. Um, I still keep a book uh, by paper, as well as the computer, just in case things get crazy, I can at least write it down and keep moving. Um, but I'm also tweeting, clipping highlights when I can, and of course, managing everything else in the press box. We are one big open room. So I've got play-by-play -play on one side and PA scoreboard and one a high home camera. So I've got a lot going on up there. Tell us a little bit, Bridget, about how you might incorporate uh, binoculars from time to time. Um, honestly, this past weekend is, you know, just double checking that um, kids are not moving or umpires haven't told me about changes, uh, making sure the right numbers are in the right spots as I've, as I've been told. Um, especially when visiting teams don't have front numbers. Checking those binoculars, making sure everybody's in the same spot. So we've had a couple of uh, instances where the umpires weren't told of substitutions until the kid rolled up for uh, the plate, their plate appearance. So got to check them every once in a while. Something I hadn't thought about till our situation here at Willamette, where we've had some limitations to our computer system over the last uh, few days. And for our baseball and softball over the weekend, we were prepared to be able to use a hotspot, either a hotspot or a phone turned into a hotspot. And we were fortunate to be able to get good enough internet to do what we needed to, to have our stats be uploaded uh, for live stats. But having the uh, book available is something we did too, in case we needed it, to have an actual scorebook. But you may have to play on occasion because of weather. 
at an off-campus site and you may need some sort of hotspot when you're at that location if there's not any sort of wired or even wireless internet. So let me uh, have us move on with Ryan talking a little bit about what he sees in terms of stats personnel. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And I, I want to echo your comment there. I think that's well-timed um, on having a hotspot handy or just some kind of alternative um, Wi-Fi solution, especially in early season here with some of these neutral site tournaments that teams are playing in. Um, as far as my perspective, um, I, I preface by saying that I, I haven't worked in softball. I've worked exclusively in baseball. Um, I've had a variety of locations for press boxes. I've been above the first base dugout where you can see most of the field, but not entirely into the right field corner. Um, where I am now, um, we are fortunate to play in a AAA ballpark where you can see pretty much everything. Um, but the common theme where regardless of where the press box has been located, um, somewhere to bridge it, keep a pair of binoculars. I also keep a couple pieces of blank paper um, and a couple of copies of season stats with me, um, just either for reference during the game, if we need to write something down, um, what have you. Um, Personnel-wise, have done baseball alone, have had interns with me um, at, at both places that I've been on baseball. Um, and then as far as at, here at Utah, because we play in a AAA ballpark, uh, MLB has been sending uh, their data casting staff to some of our games since the infrastructure is already in the ballpark, uh, mostly for data collection purposes. Um, and I mentioned that because when it comes to things like Bridget was talking about, such as defensive changes, pinch hitters, uh, any kind of substitutions, um, everyone is on the same team, um, regardless of whether you're the official scorer doing social media, you know, no one's trying to one up the other person. Um, and, and in that aspect, it's just everyone's trying to make sure that people have correct information. I'm going to step in just briefly again for a moment to say, in my experience, particularly if you have to rely on student help when you have multiple events at home and they're going to be doing the statting, it really helps to find students that have kept a manual scorebook in the past. It makes it really easy to explain to them how to do it in, in a computer system. And we have one very good student that's been doing it, I think, since his freshman year, and now he's a junior. So that's something to keep in mind as you're looking for people that may be able to help you out. And Frank, fill us in a little bit on your situation at New Mexico. So the big thing we do here for New Mexico, especially on the uh, more so with baseball and softball, is I actually, when I'm at games, I'm the scorer, but I'm usually not inputting. I'm usually just saying what it was this past weekend, I let our student who was the act, we actually have a student who inputs everything because he kind of likes it. And so I let him make all the decisions and I let him either make a right decision, wrong decision, and kind of uses a learning process, but it, it does help to have an extra person. If you have a person who can input, which freed me up for one game, I did the scoreboard. One game I was doing social. One game I was actually doing swimming graphics because uh, we had swimming championships. But it allowed me to move around a little bit and not be just stuck to the computer. I went and ran down and took a couple of photos that we needed. So if you have someone who can input, it's helpful. Um, just remember that you're the AIC, which is adult in charge when you're there. Uh, so, you know, I, I allowed our student to make a mistake and I allowed him to work through the mistake and kind of figure out where he made a mistake in scoring. And uh, he actually listened to our radio guy. And that's probably the mistake he made. Um, but that to me is the biggest thing. I always say this to utilize all the people in the press box. It's if you have, like Ryan was saying, you've got extra sets of eyes where the PA guy might notice the pinch hitter that you wouldn't notice because you're typing in a weird play or you have to quick tweet out a social or whatever. And then the other thing we do is we keep a, we have an iPad up there. Uh, it's my personal iPad, but we have an extra iPad or a computer that has the game feed. If you're running the game feed, it is usually 30 seconds behind. And so for us, we actually had a computer this past week. As soon as a weird play popped up in real life, I just hit, uh, I think it's alt, the windows key and R and it recorded screen recorded until the play passed. And then we could deal with it later. And so that was one thing because our our stupid system won't let us rewind. So if I don't see it on, in live time on the on the on the screen, I'm screwed. 
So we literally all and, and screen recorded it anytime there's a weird play so we could double check it later. Thanks, Frank. I think one of the things that's important to remember, regardless of what level uh, you're at, if it's Division One, Division Two, Division Three, the NAIA, at community colleges, wherever you're at, it generally takes one person to be the primary person doing the stats and inputting them or writing them down in a book. But it, everybody else in the press box, as Frank said, can help out and provide you with some clarity, catch something if you happen to miss it, et cetera. Um, another thing that um, you might talk about briefly is getting word rosters, printing it out, uh, using the opposing SID perhaps for some help. Does one of you want to talk about that? I know I should push it toward one of you. Ryan, what do you think? Sorry, Robert. Speaker got kind of jumbled there. You mind repeating the question? Oh, Apologies. Just, yeah, just to mainly talk about printing out word rosters ahead of time for folks and utilizing the opposing SID when they happen to be there. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think, you know, one of the one of the helpful things in baseball and softball is, you know, during the week, there's always the like in most sports, the traditional email exchange and handoff of, um, you know, stat crew rosters, word rosters, season staff and so forth. Um, you know, typically what, what we'll do in, in, in baseball here at our place is we'll print, you know, a handful of season stats for both teams. Um, a handful of word rosters for both teams. And then, you know, we can distribute those to the coaches, the press box personnel, PA, you know, any radio and and, and so forth, streaming announcers that we have here on site. Um, and then I also uh, will utilize, just have a, a, a set of not only season stats, but a word roster with me um, at my seat. Um, if we are fortunate enough to have the visiting SID with us on site, um, you know, again, just not only another set of eyes for in-game assistance that might pop up and questions that might pop up, um, but it also affords the opportunity to to get them connected with PA, uh, streaming talent and so forth for, you know, any kind of questions that might come up related to pronunciations, um, anything else that, you know, might be specific to that other team. Good. I wanted to also mention um, that... You want to make sure ahead of time that the computer is working, that your printer is working, live stats, et cetera. Those are you know just simple things to make sure it's going. And then we're going to have Frank talk a little bit about meeting with umpires and, and being able to get a good relationship with them. Yeah, you had, the biggest thing I do, is, and this is more so for softball, because the press box is generally closer. Uh, baseball, we're up a little higher and we're a little further away. Uh, is I always introduce myself, let them know where I am. And I always tell them, hey, yeah, any changes, make sure you signal them in. And the one thing that'll piss an umpire off is if you announce, like I always tell IPA guy, like don't do the, like they're not in yet. Wait, wait, they're not in yet. Because like the umpire will be writing down the change. And then you just sit there and go, pitch running at first base. And he's like, well, you don't need, you know, because that the first time you do that, the umpire's like, okay, so they don't need me. And then they'll never signal it in after that. So always kind of, you got to rein in some of your press box people a little bit. But if you go and physically talk to them, hey, my name's Frank. I'm going to be right back there. Just signal it to me. We'll get it announced. It allows them, it just humanizes you. And then, you know, a lot of times, like when they wave, sometimes I'll be a smart ass. And when they wave, I'll be like, hey, and just do it kind of silly. But it humanizes you and then it builds a rapport. And now the softball, they know who I am. So I see them. I'll be like, Hey Terry, you know, and, and you build a rapport and then it's easier for them to make the, they'll want to make the changes. They'll want to help you out and stuff like that. That's it. To me, that's the biggest thing is, is the introduction to humanize it. Ryan works with his coaches ahead of time. Uh, with some handouts, et cetera. Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, one of the things that that kind of I've been doing and been invited to each fall um, is our introductory team meeting um, where, you know, the coaches will go over, you know, all the, the usual kind of preseason things in terms of how the team runs, uh, the different support areas of the team and so forth. Um I go up and give a basically five to 10 minute, just quick rundown of, of what I do with the team as, as the communications contact. Um, I have a handout that I distribute to the, to the team um, and the student athletes. 
um, in terms of, you know, media guidelines, um, tips for how the players should, you know, just do's and don'ts for social media. Um, and then at the bottom of that, there's just some miscellaneous notes. And one of them has to do with the role that official scorers play in our game, in our, in our sport. Um, basically, in, in layman's terms, it's the professional way of saying that official scorers are, are the ones deciding on hits and errors, not the student athletes, not the coaches. Um, the way that it's written verbatim on the sheet is official scorers are tasked with a difficult yet crucial duty at all levels of baseball and in all ballparks. Accordingly, they are to be respected for the service they provide to our sport. Um, now, I also want to clarify in including that note in my handout that if I misapply a rule, if I miss a pinch hitter, or if I miss a dis defensive substitution, like, please tell me. And, you know, we've, we've, we've never had an issue about one of those types of instances getting, getting rectified. Um, it, admittedly, I will tell you that it happens to me my first couple of AAA games every year where there's some very, very subtle differences between college and, and professional baseball. And Frank, I'm sure can speak to that. Um, but the, the gist of what I'm getting at with with that bullet point in my handout is quite honestly with student athletes, I'm just not interested in talking about hits and errors. But if a co if our head coach wants to have a you know civil and polite discussion about something with me, like all ears. Yeah. In our situation, I ask for the the players to talk to either their position coach or ultimately the head coach, and then have the head coach get with me if there's something they feel needs to be addressed. We're going to get back to Bridget now again and have her fill us in a little bit on the SID needs and, and what she does for that. You know, um, we kind of hit on a bit of it uh, earlier, but like, you know, making sure your rosters are into the NCAA and having the correct um, short names. Uh, I know they've hit on that a past couple of weeks. Uh, so your, your kids' stats show up correctly. Um, what else? You know, making sure the trading rosters are early enough um, in the week. It's I try to do it Mondays, but Mondays are tough when you've got a midweek. So maybe it's Saturday afternoon for that Tuesday, Wednesday game, and then it's Monday for the weekend. Um, but a big part, um, I try, especially as a, at Richmond, we have a lot of, uh, I call them snowbird teams come down. And because it's crossover season and they've got generally – uh, basketball or hockey or lacrosse as they're, you know, stuck back on campus. Um, I try to ask if, if there's anything that, if there's a weird jerseys or, um, I know I've got a, my shortstop wears two normally, but on Sunday in the Sunday reds, he's 52 just because of a Jersey got misplaced somewhere along the line over the summer. So like knowing those little things, um, you know, talking ahead with coach about, um, if we're doing a the pod pitching system, just over communicating with uh, not only my coaches, but making sure that the SAD, um, whether it's home or for away, just knowing, giving them enough information so they can run a, the event smoothly or I can run the my event smoothly. Um, that's really my biggest goal of trying to get get ahead on things. Um, whether And then you know, notes for our media, um, our broadcasters, pronunciation guides um, for PA as well, you know, just trying to make the game day go as smooth as possible. And hopefully that, I mean, as much as we can control, try to control uh, early and get it smooth. Sounds good. I want to remind our participants to use the Q&A section for asking questions. We have um, a few in there. One I'm gonna bring in now, even though it also fits in very late in our conversation about making changes, but we're asked about what is your approach on dealing with a contested call from an opposing school and how would you approach it when your team is pushing for a contested call? This particular attendee today says they have a coach that fights for every hit, earned and unearned runs, et cetera. So what, is, what are your basic approaches to that? And um, Frank, I'm gonna go to you on this one, at least initially. <laughs> Well, the, the basic approach is usually someone sends it to me. <laughs> um, for us, my 
God bless my coaches. They usually don't say anything. I'm kind of lucky in that way. Um, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if something comes up, the one thing I've learned, and I'm this is this is 53 year old Frank talking, and not 23 year old Frank. 30 years ago, I would never have said this, but don't. It, it's not a an affront to you. If someone is questioning a call, it is not an affront to you. It does not mean you are a terrible scorer. It does not mean you don't know what you're doing. It could just mean they have a different opinion. Okay. So what I usually do to appease a coach, because if you tell a coach, no, you're wrong, I got news for you. They hate that. They do not like that at all. Um, what I'll usually just tell a coach is, Huh, I'll tell you what, let me go back. I'll look at it. I'll look at it later. And it's going to stay the way it is for now. Let me look at it tonight. I'll let you know in the morning. You good with that? They will always, almost always go, okay. Good what I got here. No, look at it right now. Like, no, shut up. You're not going to look at it right now. Just, they'll, they'll be fine. If you tell them, let me. Do. And then for me, if I have a question, I got a couple of people I will send it to. Sometimes I've thrown it into the scoring assistance Facebook page. But there's, there's ways, you know, send it to somebody, send it to someone you trust and just get, ask a second opinion. And then the, this is, this is because I've done this long enough. I have a pretty good back knowledge of, oh, well, no, it should be this because I've seen it in this kind of thing. And when you open it up and bring it out to more people, you're opening it up for the chance that someone goes, well, it's actually this because it actually happened in our game and it's how we did it. And it gets you the second opinion where you can go back and explain to a coach, here's why I ruled it this way. I did talk to these people and they all agreed it's this, 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 and this, right? They still may not like it, but in the end, it's your call. So that would be, that. that's my, that's how I do it. And like I said, a lot of people just send it to me. So <laughs> feel free. I want to mention that we also had a suggestion from the Q&A to exchange rosters really early in the year, kind of get that out of the way and um, get that to and from your opponents. And that can be very helpful. And also, of course, you know, check later to see if there have been some updates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things uh, go, I want to go back to what Bridget was talking about with some of the things that, that she was doing. When you get to the game and you're up in the print, you have the rosters and everything, do yourselves a favor and go into each dugout with your phone and take a picture. They always have like a little lineup card, their own little lineup card. And you don't need the lineup card, right? You've already got it. But that lineup card always lists because coaches don't want to think, right? They're in the middle of the game. They got eight million. They don't want to think about things. So what do they do? They list every available hitter, lefty, righty, and every available pitcher. Because the stacker roster has 40 guys. Well, they don't have 40 guys eligible in the game. They only have, I think, 28. I think you're only allowed 28 in NCA. It might be 30 in NAIA. Could be more in JUCO. I don't know, but it, it at least eliminates a bunch of guys. Where I go, okay, that dude's not playing. That dude's not playing. That dude's not playing. Sometimes they change catchers. Right? Is that a 13 or an 18 or is it a 19 or is it a 16? Well, you can look and go. Well, 16. He's not even. He's not even here because he's not listed on that roster. It has to be 13. Right? They only have two left-handed hitters on the bench. So it's either this guy or this guy. It does help to take that picture and you just have it on your phone. Really good point, Frank. We wanted to uh, mention too, that one of the things you can do is have on hand a printed copy of the stats manual, or at least the portion that applies specifically to the rule keeping. There it is um, with Bridget. And that can be very helpful when you have specific questions. You can also uh, look at it later or search for it online and get to the NCAA rules and look in there when you have a specific question. We're now going to get into talking about some of the basics of things that you do in keeping stats. We're going to go back to Frank, just very popular today, to fill us in a little bit about double plays, rundowns, and some of those situations. So th and this is this is a little bit of a program issue. Uh, so when you have double plays, first of all, you, you do want to have, even if you're doing scoring and you're like, I'm not going to keep a book, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back up. You definitely want some sort of scratch paper in case you get behind. Uh, in a pen or a pencil or something, because it's really helpful in the rundowns. And again, this this is the big, so this is a scoring issue with the rub, rundowns. There's a couple of things with it, uh, or with double plays, excuse me. On a double play, both Presto and Stack Crew, 
if it is a fly ball double play, right? So it's like a lineup, like fly ball to go center, and then they double up the guy trying to score, right? And it's eight, six, two. Stacker and Presto on a fly ball double play gives the putouts to the first number you type and the last number you type. Okay. So eight, six, two, eight gets put out, two gets put out. On any ground ball double play, only the last two numbers get a put out. So in a six, four, three double play, four gets a double play, four gets put out, three gets a put out. If you have one of those weird double plays where it's like, Six four, then they throw home, and that guy's you know two five one, right? So it's like six foot something stupid like that. And the putouts are not the last two guys. Whatever you type in, six four two five one, it gives a putout to five and one. Whether or not five and one got the putouts or not, it's always going to give it to the last two numbers. So you have to cheat the program. So if it happens, you just give. The first assist in the last, so you, that would actually be six, four, one, right? That way, four gets put out, one gets put out. And you go, well, what about the assists? The programs will both let you just go A2, space, A5, to randomly give assists. And those can go on any box to anyone. You can put it on a guy who's not even moving. Guy who's been put out. So you have to cheat the program when that happens. Okay. And, and then what I usually do is in a comment section, I use comments all the time. Comments are your friends. I go to the comment and go, the actual rundown was 64215. And then people will understand it. So that's it's a program thing. And then uh I I do get a lot of questions on the double play thing. Well, if it's a ground ball or a if it's a force or a reverse force double play, there is no RBI. And that's the same in softball. I know the softball rule book actually doesn't say that. And in, uh, this is so stupid. <laughs> this is dumb. But in 2016, they put out a memo, which if you were not around, but many SADs who are on this call right now, uh, probably were in high school or junior high school in 2016. But in 2016, they put out a memo and they said, this is a mistake. There is no double, there is no RBI in softball on a, Round ball double play. They still haven't put it in the rule book, mind you, but NCA, awesome. Um, so if it's a ground ball or a, if, what's a reverse force double play is like when the first baseman steps on the bag, eliminating the force, but they that runner was still like having to go to second and they get her out, right? That's a reverse force double play. A fly ball double play, you can have an RBI. Any other double play, you can have an I, RBI. If you type in GDP, there is no RBI, okay? That's the difference between the two. I hope that made sense. We had a bizarre um, double play happen in our first softball home games the other day. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it makes me think of one thing with what Frank had said, that you may be able to enter that whole play the way you saw it with all those numbers, and then when you have time to think about it later, split it into what Frank was saying in terms of, making sure you have the putouts going to the right people as the last two yeah, in the sequence and add the assists. It may be too much of a jumbled mess in your brain to try to figure it out at the time. Maybe take care of that a bit later. And we want to move on now to hits and errors. And um, one thing we've talked about in our planning was that, you know, give the hitter some benefit of the doubt in determining whether it's a sacrifice or not. Sometimes that might be difficult. Um, Bridget may want to comment on that a bit but also she's going to fill us in a little bit on dealing with the sunshine. Oh, um, you know, benefit of the doubt on, um, with the sacrifice, um, I kind of knowing how your guys go, um, helps too. Um, uh, I know that my coach, they're going to run. If we've got two on, doesn't matter who, where you are in the lineup, you better be ready to bond. So like, that's a general rule with that I know that my coach goes with. Um, so I, I tend to usually always kind of say that's a sacrifice. He's not trying to hit unless I know it's one of my speedier guys um, to reach via the bunt. Um, I know um, about my field, our players face the sun or most of our sun comes from behind the press box, behind home plate. Uh, and especially this past couple of weekends, we've had some sunny blips and 
right field especially nobody knows really how to play right field when it's super sunny and just because the kid has sunglasses and they're on his hat I you know I can't give an air because he didn't put his sunglasses on or um so like it's it's tough because they're kind of wobbling around and they definitely you know they lost it in the sun but you, you can't necessarily give the sun th that error to that player because of the sun um which I guess I joke with my press box guys because they are much tougher on those um those you know grizzly old um PA guys and um, scoreboard guys have seen a lot of baseball as well and they almost always want an error on those sunny plays and I was like I, I can't I can't give bad routes <laughs> an error necessarily so can't really give that 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 sunshine um that that error because of of that I know my coach is one of the few uh, mm -hmm. but can't you can't do that one <laughs> Frank, you want to talk briefly for us about, um, you know, balls that are put into play and hit a runner um, or or uh, dealing with a hard hit that goes off of a, the first baseman, maybe the third baseman, um, those situations, and also advancing on a throw. Sure. So it's a couple of different things. It's, you know, baseball and softball. First of all, baseball and softball are very different for some of this stuff, okay? So if you are a baseball person by trade, and you have to do softball. You have to take a lot of the baseball thought process out because they are different. They are vastly different games. Okay. And, and so you can't, you can't, you can't apply baseball logic to softball and you can't really apply softball logic to baseball. It goes both ways. Uh, big difference in the two sports uh, in softball, the runner first and third are all, almost always inside the bag. Okay. And this is usually more for third base because there's more right-handed hitters. But if your third baseman is in, so, and this is actually in the rule book, but if the third baseman is in and there is a ball that is hit fairly hard and it deflects, and the, the key word is deflects, okay? So it's not like a, a little routine hopper, even though she's in. If, if it is a, a hard hit shot that deflects off third base, there is no thought process. It is a base hit. Every time it is in the rule book, you are giving that third baseman the benefit of the doubt because she is in. Okay. Another difference between baseball and softball in baseball, say it's a, a runner up first ground ball hits the runner going to second in baseball. The runner is out. And then the put out would go to the nearest fielder, which is probably the second baseman, right? So it's just for you on the on the runner. The batter gets credited with a base hit every time. There is no thought process. Okay, the only time you wouldn't get a base hit is if it was an infield fly and you get hit by it. And honestly, I've never seen that because no one no one is that dumb. Baseball players are dumb. They're not that dumb. Okay, they're not getting hit with an infield fly. But in softball, same exact situation. It is scores judgment. If a ball hits the runner. And the score feels, you know what, that the girl is going to make play. She's going to make it. She's going to get somebody out. That is a fielder's choice. The runner's still out for an assisted, but the batter reaches on a fielder's choice. There's subtle differences in the rules. So this is dorky. I get off on this, but you have to read them and you have to read them every year because there are some subtle changes and stuff and be familiar with them. I, I know Bridget said she has like the printout. I don't have the printout. I have it up on my computer at all times. So that if I have to search it, I can just search the word, right? I can search indifference and boom, there it comes. So that's a little cheat there. Frank, when's the best time to put down that the runner has advanced on a throw? So if there is a sacrifice fly, there's nobody on base but a runner on third and someone, you know, fly out to seven, there's a sacrifice fly. I have, I, I keep seeing that the person scored, like advanced on the throw. No, they didn't. They just scored. So the advancing on a throw is literally when someone's going an extra base because a throw went to a different base. So the best example is there's a runner on second, uh, uh, single to, to center, right? That runner on second is going to come around and go home. The runner, the, the, the center field is trying to throw the runner out. Regardless of what happens, 
the runner on the batter who hits first and goes, oh, they threw it home. They go to second, not a double. That is a single. And then you would put plus T to advance on the throw. That's when you're putting advancing on the throw. Hey, Frank, can you kind of explain how you, um, with all that's going on, if the ball's coming from center to home, the plays at the plate, how do you also watch the runner, the batter runner going, like whether he decided to make it into it or, you know, continue his run or mm-hmm. it's a so, to it or they're just the base hit? So at, at Isotopes Park, which is like right there, it's like literally right there. Um, it, I can see it out my window. Uh we have one scorer, one guy who, as soon as a ball's hit, he grabs his binoculars to watch it in center field or whatever, and he can't see the rest of the field because he has no peripheral vision. So I don't don't use binoculars to watch the game. I'll do it to like check the the bullpen and things like that. Um, but you sort of just have to train yourself and kind of know the situation. Like, okay, that guy might go to second. Kind of as you're watching the play, just every now and then look. And again, that's where the other eyes can help you. Hey, did that guy go to second? Was he going the whole time? And just ask. But I try and look. Like, I don't need to watch the play at the play until the play happens. Like, I can see the ball. I can kind of see the, the person running. So you sort of train yourself to use peripheral vision and to catch things like that. Ryan, can you fill us in on some of the more common earned and unearned run situations and how to score some of those? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think, you know, it's it's important to acknowledge, you know, leads into a conversation about hits and errors um, and how we determine earned and unearned runs relates to the context of an error. Um, I know during our planning, we talked about the difference between an assumed out error and an advancement error. Um, so we can talk more on that in a second, but um Generally speaking, my first step that I always take whenever there's a possible situation where we could have an earned run, earned run, um, is on my scratch paper, I draw out a diamond representing the bases. Um, And if there is an error in the inning, or or again, just something that could trigger an unearned run, um, I write down what what the basis looked like in that moment, i.e. if the error did not happen. Um, remember the context of an error is in the context of an unearned run. You're, you're trying to evaluate if you take away past balls, if you take away errors, would this run have still happened or scored? That's, that's the general kind of question that you're, you're trying to answer. Um, if it would have scored anyway, it's earned. If it, if it would not have scored, it becomes unearned. Um, so on that scratch paper, I then keep a just running list of, okay, in my opinion, without the without the errors or without the pass balls and so forth, um, would these have still scored? And that's how I guide my um, decision on if something was earned or unearned. I know Frank is going to talk in a minute about team unearned runs, which I think is important to talk about in this webinar. Um, favorite statistic for a lot of us. Um Frank, I'll just wrap it up by talking about an assumed out error versus an advancement error. An assumed out error is is quite literally like there would have been an out recorded on this play if not for the error. Think about, you know, shortstop boots a ball where they come in and just would have made the throw to first base on a ground ball, um, camped under it, sunlight not a factor, drops it. Like that's an assumed out error because – and out would have been recorded. Um, an advancement error, you you, know, you have a runner on base anyway. There's an errant throw or so forth that allows the runner to advance. Example would be in baseball. You have a runner on first. Pitcher may, makes a pickoff move to throw up the throw to first, and that throw gets away. That is a advancement error. And both of those contexts uh, are examples for how you can guide whether – a run would have scored or not, i.e. if a run would have been earned or unearned. And the part of that to keep in mind is that on those that would have made an out, when you're reconstructing the inning, what would have happened without the error, that would have created an out and and taken a runner off the base. Whereas the advancement error, if there's that throw to first and the runner gets to go to second because it's wild, when you're recreating the inning, you consider that runner to still be on first. What would have happened 
if the runner was still on first, because that error wouldn't have put them out. That error just simply gave them an extra base. This is one of the most difficult things to learn. It's probably the hardest thing that any of us do in baseball and softball scoring. So if it's, if it's a problem for you and you're new to it, it gets better over time as you see different situations and have examples in your mind that you can go off of. It, it's something that you really learn as you do it more and more. Um, so don't be afraid of it, but also realize it's a process. And now Frank will fill us in on team unearned runs. Okay. Uh, also, I, there are two questions came in my heart because it's my, my former tennis players just asked a question. And then Michael Hawkins, who was an SID when I was a student athlete. So there you go. So you think I'm old. Mike's old. <laughs> uh, but I love Mike. I'm glad he's in here. Um, okay. Team on earned runs. So team on earned runs is a really odd concept. It, first of all, it can only happen if there's a pitching change, right? If there's not a pitching change, you never have to worry about this. The program also will always ask about a team unearned run. It will ask you, okay? The easiest way for me to explain a team unearned run happens when a run should not have scored in the inning because there should have been three outs, okay? When there is a pitching change after an error, that's when a team unearned run can happen. The new pitcher does not get the benefit of previous errors in the inning. So a new pitcher comes in with two outs in the inning. Their job is to get one out before a run scores, before a runner that they put on base scores. The simplest way to explain this is this, and I'm going to use the people that are here. So Ryan is pitching. Okay, Ryan's a very good pitcher. The first batter reaches E6. Sucks for Ryan. Second batter comes up, reaches E6. Really sucks for Ryan. Third batter hits it E6. So now the bases are loaded. Okay, All three batters should have been out. The inning should be over. The coach decides, all right, Ryan, you keep pitching the ball where they're hitting it to the shortstop. And obviously our shortstop sucks. So I'm going to take you out. So then they put in Ryan, uh, Robert McKinney to pitch. Robert McKinney enters this game. He does not get the benefit of those three errors. So Robert's job is to get three outs before the first batter that he is facing, which is Bridget Robles, scores. Bridget hits a home run. Because Bridget's like that. She's going to hit a home run, and Robert really doesn't have much of a fastball anyway. The three runs that scored that all reached on E6 are unearned. We, I think we all got that. They are unearned. But the run that Bridget scored is unearned to the team because the inning should have been over. It is earned to Robert McKinney because he doesn't get the benefit of all those other errors. He should not let her score. That's the That's the goal. And he did. So that would be, it'll come up as a T in both Presto and the other pro and uh, stack crew. And that's how you get a team unearned run. You will see it as a little half square, half the, the, the square instead of the, you know, the way it looks on the, on the program. Okay. I do want to bring this up because uh, somebody had asked about the, the place runner. And I saw Ryan answer the question, how to put the place runner in on in extra innings in softball and sometimes in baseball. If that runner scores, this is, I cannot express how important this is. If that runner scores, do not put anything. Do not manually type in unearned. Do not manually type in team unearned, which is TU, okay? If you do that, as Michigan and Florida found out, because someone pointed it out to me, and I actually sent this to both teams. If you do that, it'll give you a negative earned run. So that Michigan, they went to extra innings, tied 0-0. Zero, zero. Three times the place runner scored. They put in team on earn for all three place runners. And at the end of the game, Michigan had given up negative two earned runs and uh, Florida had given up negative one earned runs, which is a hell of an ERA, but it's, it's not a thing. So don't ever put it in. And the program knows how to handle that place runner. So don't mess with it. Well, Frank has mentioned that, and we did have the request about that information. If you're playing with the runner on second as a tiebreaker, and some conferences do in both baseball or softball, the coding is R colon, and then it is what number in the batting order the person is that's going to be on second. So if they're eighth in the order, it would be R colon eight comma two. And that's saying put a runner who's eighth in the order on second base. So R colon 
whatever the position in the batting order is, comma, two. Remember that that person is going to be the person who batted last, I think, in the pre, not necessarily got the last yes. out, but batted last in the previous. Correct. So that was important. We had a question that maybe we can ha uh, deal with quickly. Um, I Hopefully, Ryan, do you have some basic ideas to, that are for people that are new to it? What are the most important things they can do to become more comfortable and be, you know, gradually moving into this this new role where they have to stat a game they're not used to? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great question um, for whoever asked that um, in the chat. Um, I, I think there's a couple keys. One is, um, or several keys. One, uh, I would encourage anyone that's that's you know getting started for the first time to um, consider jumping in the SID Scoring Assistance Facebook group. Um, that that is a safe space for people that have scoring questions to drop in video, drop in context, uh, and just quite frankly, just get some help and get some opinions. Uh, you know, no one, no one is, is ever, you know, there's never a, a bad question in, in that group. Um, and it's always in the spirit of, of everybody helping each other. Ryan, um, what's that group again? SID scoring assistance, right, Frank? Yes. SID scoring assistance. Yeah. And that was um, located where? On Facebook. Facebook. Thank you. Um, the other thing, like along those same lines, um, in the Pac-12, uh, our baseball SIDs, we have a group text thread. Um, there is as much playful banter in that group thread as there is, hey, here's a piece of video. You know, do we think this could have been a hit or an error? How, how would you have scored this? Uh, so there, there's never there's never shame in asking for help and asking questions, especially when you're first learning, because we were all we were all there once. Um, I would also encourage folks to um, retrieve a stat crew cheat sheet, which I think was updated. I don't know who did it in the last couple of years, but pretty recently was updated with um, not just some coding tips, but some specific situations that um, are maybe less common just to give some guidance and have that handy. Um, and then, you know, I know this isn't quite an immediate answer in the moment of something, but the other thing that I'll just say is every game that you do, you're going to get a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I was, when I was 23 doing baseball for the first time, I made some colossal mistakes <laughs> and it was, it was embarrassing in the moment. And, you know, there were some things that I had to fix from time to time, but the more that you do this, you know, the more games that you do, you watch a couple games, um, you'll, you'll get better. And, and it's never, never get discouraged. And I think to go back to what Frank said earlier about people having questions about hits and errors, it's never, it's never personal. It's never at you. It's just someone has a different opinion. That's all. We had a question too, I think in the chat at one point about how do we score it if an umpire gets hit by a batted ball? Um, it looks like Frank wants to take that on. <laughs> Yeah, do you just congratulate the hitter because it's a base hit? It's what well, hey, Robert, can I jump in on that? We, in 2018, we had a no-hitter broken up by one of those. I want to move over to Bridget to fill us in a little bit. I know her experience is mostly with baseball, but to talk a bit about some of the things that you may encounter specifically in softball. And then Frank will fill us in a little bit on dealing with the designated player and pitchers and probably some of the, you know, bizarre substitutions that can happen in softball. But Bridget, fill us in. Oh, um, it has been a few years since I've uh, worked directly with softball, but um, a lot of the things that um, kind of keep coming up for my, uh, friends of mine, um, and kind of like the same thing, going through text threads and getting asked like, hey, this is what happened in putting it this way. Um, like runners leaving early, um, and making sure you've kind of have that designation that the out was there because of the kid, uh, the runner left early in the right base to put it with, uh, for the put out. Um, that's a big one. Um, and it's just R L E with the put out. Um, and then knowing the difference kind of, um, the minute difference <laughs> on a, a slap or a sacrifice and it's legit kind of where, how the how the batter holds holds their bat, whether you know squared around or kind of a, a slap swing, you know the, the really quick just turn of the wrist and heading down the base path. So little things like that that 
um, it just kind of takes time. Maybe you're going out to practices to watch um, how your team does uh, runs their scrimmages and certain plays that they're working on. So it's, you know, not only are you learning the sport, but like on how your team kind of preps for things and uh, pra what they practice. Um, it's just getting more eyes and repetitions and watching, um, you know, just getting more practice in yourself. Um, sometimes it's, you know, early, kind of like uh, Ryan was saying early in my career, I watched a lot of, of baseball. I watched a lot of um, SEC softball just to see what other, how other schools um, played the game. Cause it's definitely different than when I was a high schooler. Um, but also I had the score up the, the live stats up seeing how, okay, that play was this way and that's how I got entered. It's a little bit more homework when you, you can. Um, and there was a few times that I emailed the guy or person. It's like, Hey, I saw this was the score. Can you like run through, run through the thoughts on like, take me along with you on how you made that decision or why it's that way along with the rule book. Like, <laughs> so I'm kind of being a little nerdy and just reading it up and watching how other schools do it. And sometimes it's just going, it's like, Hey, can I swing by and be a fly on your wall and do it in the press box and to just learn better, uh, faster. I think we talked a bit about on the slap versus bunting that in a lot of cases on a bunt, the hands may be more separated on the bat, yes. mm -hmm. the bunt and whereas they're often together to slap. And also in most cases, a slapper is also moving forward in the batter's box at the same time. And that's a hint that they're probably going to slap rather than bunt, not 100%, but but those are some of the indicators uh, that you can see on that. Uh, Frank, you want to talk to us a little bit? Well, Robert, you just muted yourself, but I, I know where you're I know where you're going. I think. Uh, Sorry, yeah, the the substitutions and the DP flex. Okay, uh, I'm, I will get to that one in a second. Uh, along with what Bridget saw about with the slap and, and all that stuff. If it is a sacrifice bond attempt and you're waffling, the, the hitter gets the benefit of the doubt. So if you think it may it might have been a sacrifice, they get a sacrifice. Okay. Especially in softball. There, there's some criteria that they have there, but if it meets it, they get a sacrifice. On the slap attempt, and there's a question in here. So if it's a slap attempt and it says on a two-two count, batter hits a double, rule of a legally batted ball. Therefore, the batter is given the third strike. The rule book only says that the batter is declared out. Yes, it does say that. Um, there's a lot of different ways to declare the batter out, yada, yada, yada. Here's what it is. And I've worked with the NCA. I'm trying to fix this. The NCA is putting me on some stuff. The NCA rule book, everyone needs to understand this. And I, and God bless Michelle Watsky. I love her. I love all those people down there. The NCA rule book was written by coaches. And so they don't give two rips on some of this stuff. So they have not fixed it properly. So it, it's, it's written differently in different parts of the rule book. But the new rule that started, I think it was last year, it might be two years, is an illegally batted ball. If you are ruled for being outside of the batter's box or you step on home plate, it used to be you were out. Immediately you're out. Now it is a delayed dead ball. The defense can choose the result of the play or – the penalty and the penalty now is it's just a strike. So if the count's two one and you do all this stuff, it's now two two. If it is a two two count and you illegally bat a ball, it is strike three. And there, I know that this is this was the thing in the SEC last year. I actually had to deal with this, but it is strike three. It is always now going to be strike three. It is, I have it pulled up in 11 21 4. If there are two strikes and any part of the batter's body is touching home plate or the ground outside the lines of the batter's box at the moment of bat ball context, and the defense chooses the standard effect for an illegally batted ball, that is strike three and the batter's out. It is always strike three. It is not a two you. Give the pitcher the strikeout. It is always a strikeout. I am working with Michelle to get this fixed in the rules. It's probably not going to get written in properly until next year, but it is always a strike. DP flex, let me get to that really quick because I know we're starting to, I could stay, but we're running out of time. Uh, the DP flex, so some coaches in softball 
will um, they put the pitcher in the in in the lineup, and they put the DP as the pitcher in the in the flex spot. They do this. The reason they do this is because in softball, if you start with nine, then you have to play nine batters the whole game. But if you do it this way, you actually get ten. You could drop down to nine and go back. Okay. My policies, I will always ask a coach, are you fl- are you flipping the DP and the flex? They will usually tell you. If they are, the lineup that you give both teams needs to match the lineup card exactly. So it's going to be wrong. Okay. And you're handing them the wrong lineup. You kind of know this. After you're done with that, flip them yourself. If they don't tell you they're flipping them and you start the game and you're like, well, hell, that's not the pitcher. That's the flex. And then the flex is so they do that thing. Just score. I always score the first two plays and then manually edit. What you do is you go into, I think it's control E, right? It's edit. So you're on the right team. You hit control E and you tab back to the very first batter and you would hit L for lineup fix. And uh, when you do the lineup fix, it'll change it for the start of the game and give the, because the starting pitcher is whoever throws the first pitch. Okay. So it could work out that a person's in the lineup card and they don't get credited for a game played. It's just kind of a thing the program does, but that's that's how you fix that. Frank, as you noted, we're getting short on time, but can can you give us a very quick answer of how to score somebody batting out of order? In this case, the example we had in the Q&A was that the person batted, well, the person who was supposed to bat was batted for by the flex, but they didn't report it. And so the original person who was supposed to bat would be out. But how do okay. you record that out statistically? What what do you say? Okay, so anytime there's a batting out of order, a legal batter, it's always going to be to you. So that's like the, the catch-all is to you. But those two things are different. If the flex bats, so the flex is actually in the lineup, right? And then they they bat, but they didn't say anything. That is an illegal batter. And in, in a legal batter, the illegal batter is the one that is out. So you give her the at-bat and the two unassisted. In a batting out of order, the proper batter, the one that was supposed to bat. So if you have the numbers, right? If the if one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is batting. So if one bats, whatever, two bats, whatever, and then four bats and four singles, okay? Four is batting out of order because four doesn't follow two. Three follows two. The proper batter is three. So three is out. And since three is out, what number follows three? Four. Four comes up again. But that's the difference in the two. The proper batter is out in a batting out of order. In an illegal at bat, the illegal batter is the one that is out. Ryan, I don't know if you have any uh, experience with this too, Bridget, but especially Ryan, if you could comment a bit about dealing with official reviews uh, and things that may happen in Division One that the rest of us at the moment don't have to encounter very often. Yeah, are you just for clarity, Rob, are you looking for reviews on hits and errors or like how replay works for like really any kind of official review that will help uh, our division one SIDs that may be suddenly dealing with that? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of give a two part answer if that's okay. Um, you know, yeah, with the advent of some conferences now using official replay review, um, that can lead to, you know, things changing from how they were originally input, you know, whether it was someone was safe and the replay deems that they are out. Um, what I do, I mean, I don't, I, Frank, Bridget, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any mandate to do this, but just in the spirit of good practice, what I tend to do is, you know, pending the outcome of the replay, uh, I'll change the play-by-play to reflect the outcome of the replay and then add a comment. Um, such as, you know, play was originally ruled such and such, team A, team B challenges, call overturned type deal. Um, I know at this point in time, you know, there's a there's a selection of conferences that are using official replay review, seems to be expanding each year, but that's typically what I do. Frank, Bridget, I don't know if you all have anything to add on that. Uh, I use comment a lot, Bridget. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good plan. We're going to be going just a bit past the hour mark. 
want to bridge it to talk uh, briefly about troubleshooting and, and tough plays that are happening, and you're trying to get it done before the next play happens, and some of your recommendations for that, and then we'll uh, move on to a little bit about wrapping up the game at the end before we close. This is a big part of why I still frequently use um, a pencil to do my scorebook, uh, a paper scorebook, just so I can slow down the game. Um, I mean, I'm still, uh, or that that scratch piece piece of paper, uh, you know, pitch by pitch, and maybe it's a little bit from uh, learning the MILB, the the major leagues program where you had to write out the code the whole time. So like memorizing the code, sometimes my scratch paper is the code for minor league baseball, but it's pitch by pitch and how the guys move. And it's similar to what Ryan mentioned at the beginning is re rebuilding the, um, the unearned runs in that situation, but it's slowing down the game so I can make the correct, um, scoring decision in the program and yes I've, I've gotten some coaches like well, it's not up there yet. it's not up there yet it's not up there I was like sir that's what you're worried about the scoreboard like like the game continues um you know you only get two minutes between game or innings now and um 20 seconds between pitches so like kind of have to be and then with the multiple multitude of things other things that we're doing up in the press box and having to focus on um having that pen and paper, that scratch paper is, is very key to making sure it's recorded correctly. Um, so that's, that's always a big, big help to have, um, to rebuild and slow the game down. And it gives you the chance to make those corrections a bit later, if you need to, to go in and edit. Mm -hmm. One other thing, sometimes if something happens and I'm inputting stats and for whatever reason, I, something happens, a computer, freezes or whatever happens, I'll have somebody else there write down the plays and they will be writing down ball, strike, foul, so we can put that in and enter each of the pitches when I'm able to get back. Frank, I think we chose you ahead of time to fill us in on things that you do post-game that can help out the media, can help out the teams. Um, what things do you do in the in the post-game? So when we wrap it up, the, the big thing is – because I know this pisses me off because it's happened once or twice, but you're waiting for a game file, you're waiting for a game file, and then I see the, the graphic from the other team, and then I see a story from the other team with the box score. And so, you know, we make it, we have somebody run, we have somebody else run the stats. There's five people in our press box, right? So somebody can run the stats to the two coaches. Like, that's fine. And then we stay back, and I have, we, we make a PDF of the box score, we will make the, the the pack file and we'll send the XML. Maybe you're home and you don't have your computer. And so it's just nice to send the XML. And then we will do that and send that right away. Get that off your plate and out so that the other person, wherever they are, can do it, right? If you think about it in your own life and you have a road baseball game and it, you know, you're getting your ass kicked, it's 8-1, Right. You could probably write that story ahead of time. All you need is the file and the box score. And then I can go to dinner with my wife. And now you're sitting there waiting. Send it, send it, send it, send it, send it. So get that's the habit. Send it to a person quickly so that they can get it. They can move on with your life and you can get your stuff done. But that's usually what we do. Uh, that's the first thing. Always make sure that you, uh, if you have, you make sure you get your cap files. Uh, if you don't know how to deal with cap files in, uh, the scoring assistance page, Dave Petroff wrote an entire thing on cap files on how they work. What are the troubleshooting if they don't work? And then you always want to make sure that you're posting within the game program itself. You post, this is a stat group thing, post the stat files. If you post files, the stats, you don't need an update a cap from the, from your opponent because it'll automatically, the program automatically adds that game to the previous one that just did. And so when I do the WAC tournament, I get the cap files at the beginning, and then I just remember to post them. And it's, you know, everybody, it's great. They send me cap files anyway, but I don't need them. It's nice to have them as a backup, but that's a habit. And we we literally have it written out. Like, if you have this thing that kind of talks a little bit about, like, uh, the quick startup and the wrap-up and things like that um, on the, the the reference card, but we have it written out. This is what we do for every game afterwards. 
just in case it's not me. You know, I've had a new baseball SID five straight years. Like <laughs> we got to have it written down somewhere for these guys and, and girls. We have a female do it. So we have it written down for them. I wanted to check real briefly, Ryan, if there's anything you want to add on, on post-game stuff or something that you guys do maybe a little differently at Utah. No, I think Frank covered it pretty, pretty well. I think the, the emphasis, you know, that I, I would just encourage everyone to try to be considerate of is, you know, like Frank said, just obviously things come up, you know, there might be a, a scoring change that happens after the game. You know, we get it. It's, it's all good. Um, but do try to get those files sent out um, in a timely fashion as, as quickly and as efficiently as you can, because, you know, the, the the reason I'll give for that is one, you know, I think everyone is trying to get their season stats updated for their own team. Um, but I will also say, like, in our case, in the Pac-12, you know, we also, and I think several other conferences, um, you know, the schools have to upload a PAC file to Presto or to the conference website so that the conference can run stats. So um, I think just being sensitive of that and just doing the best you can to to distribute files in, in an efficient way is good. Um, I know the way that thing, technology has evolved, uh, the files that people attach or don't attach can, can vary. Um, generally at this point, I go pack file PDF XML. Um, I haven't included HTML for a couple of years. Um, just because I think most most school websites can take in an XML box score at this point, but that's kind of where where we're at here. Sounds great. Uh, quickly, right before we go here, I wanted to mention that in Presto Stats, which we use in a lot of other schools, particularly in the NAIA and Division Three, in there in reports, you can email the stats right from in the stats program to yourself or to an opponent. Uh, be careful to make sure you get the uh, email address correct because it doesn't let you know if it actually goes where you want it to go. Um, but you can do that from there and that can be very helpful. We're in a situation where we have one internet provider in our conference and most of the other schools have another. So we have to also upload to someplace different uh, for the conference. Want to thank the folks who asked questions. Uh, in some cases, we were able to get to them. In some cases, we weren't. Want to thank our panelists also for answering some of those questions to provide the answers. We will be having an educational lounge at the CSC Unite in Las Vegas this summer. And a good chunk of what that's gonna be is questions and answers so we can cover all these really complicated plays that we didn't have time to get to today. And we'd like to give a big thanks to our presenters, to Bridget Robles, Robles to uh, Ryan Gallant and to Frank Mercogliano for helping us out. We really appreciate that with baseball and softball stats and the stats rules and uh, you know dealing with those difficult scoring plays. And again, we appreciate the questions and the Q&A. This webinar will be on demand later today in a video format and also as a podcast. So share that information with your colleagues out there. We encourage you to check the CSC uh, website at collegesportscommunicators.com for updated information on what's on tap for the programming and continuing education. Tomorrow on Wednesday, February 28th at 2 p.m., there will be the Diversity and Inclusion Committee providing a webinar that they're hosting entitled Keeping DEI in the Forefront. We invite you to join in and pre-register at the CSC website. We're taking off the month of March from webinars but we'll be returning with more in April, not necessarily statistics, but other webinars. Stay tuned. And again, we'll hopefully see you in Las Vegas as well. Thanks again for being with us today.